Okay, sorry about that. I will post this into part one and part two. I moved it and I think the cord got, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Colin. I need tech video. assistance. I had to read this once in a church at Christmas when I was nine years old. I used to remember the dress. I had to go up to the pulpit. And, okay. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Caesar Augustus. And so, um, remember, if what do governments need to run? A leader. Okay, a leader. What else do they need? They need... What does our government ask all of us to give them? A ledge. What? Register? Uh, what, like, what, 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 every year we have to file papers. All taxes? Taxes. They need money to run. I mean, they do need a ru rulers. I, I'm not discounting <laughs> that. But they need, they need money. You've got to pay all these people. And so, likewise, Augustus has got this huge amount of land with governors and, you know, and all this administrative stuff, and he's got to tax the people to do it. And what do you do before you tax people? You count them so that you know who um, owes taxes, what provinces to expect the most from, because they have the higher populations, so ergo, we have Joseph having to go back to Bethlehem because everyone had to return to their ancestral town. Um, this is that Augustus. So we have peace. And isn't it interesting that the prince of peace was born during the Roman peace? Find that very nice. The other thing is, after the resurrection, ascension, and the apostles are going out everywhere. We hear a lot about Paul's travels, but he's not the only one traveling. We just hear Luke's story in the book of Acts because he was Paul's companion. But remember, we have other, we have other missionary efforts going on. We hear about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and, and things like that. Um, how convenient that it was safe and easy to travel. They're not always at war. The Romans excel in roads and practical things that make life good. And so the way has been paved for that whole known world to hear the gospel. It says, Paul says in one of his letters, or it might not be Paul, it might be in the book of Hebrews, um, in, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. When everything was ready, People's hearts were ready when the world was set up in a way to make it easy to spread the gospel. It's kind of cool. Um, what else did I want to comment that Augustus did? Um, the last question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Was there a downside? Oh, sorry. oh yeah, actually, Colin, it's oh. Colin's turn. Um, was there a downside to the construction of so many be beautiful buildings hmm. in Rome? And I don't know if mine was exactly right, but other non-Roman people, specifically barbarians, became jealous of the design, so they would raid them. Okay, so it, it got their attention of other people. What else? It took out too much living space for the poor Romans. Okay, that was another thing that she mentioned. I don't discount that at all, but but yeah, um, it, it, it's sort of like um, sometimes in major cities today that have kind of fallen apart. I'm thinking like Detroit is a is a notorious place where the inner city, you know, it used to be a nice city, but then people started moving out to the suburbs and they kind of leave the city and the city just kind of falls apart and it's not good. But sometimes people come in, people with money, and they say, we're going to re-beautify the inner city, um, which is great, except <clears throat> the poor people can't afford to live there anymore. Where, where are they going to go? If you turn, we, we don't want them living in slums. But if you turn them into, you know, corporate loft apartments that cost $2,000 a month, they can't stay there. Where are they going to go? And I think something like that happened in Rome. So you have these districts that are more and more beautiful, and he's building all these buildings, and not only just expense-wise, but physically. 
Like if they build, if Augustus comes to this neighborhood and he wants to build a temple there, you know, the people are going to have to leave. They're going to have to move on. And so that could be a problem too. But, you know, but what you said, Colin, about people being jealous, the jealousy was kind of a two-edged sword. They might be jealous and want to attack, but they might be jealous and want to be Roman. Do you know what I mean? Like maybe I live in Gaul and I live in a hut. It's not very nice kind of gross you know it's like got a mud floor and everything and the Romans are building a town two miles away a Roman town like with decent streets and not only streets but they pioneered the whole like gutters where the mud and stuff would run down and like stepping stones to go across the street so you don't have to step down in the mud it's nice like, shoot those Romans have it happen and I'm moving to the Roman town and maybe I will want to be a part of that. Um, okay, so let me, well, I'm going to go back over just some things that I highlighted here. Uh, this is back to the idea that Augustus wanted to make sure that he had power, but he wanted to make sure it was all above board. So I don't get stabbed. Wait, all of what? Uh, all above board, in other words, legitimate on the outside. In this way, Augustus was the head of all the political and religious affairs of the state. When he retired from the consulship, the Senate allowed him to retain the imperium. Okay, remember, imperium is the power to command an army, but the consuls have that, but he doesn't have an army anymore, but he still has the power. Like, he's still commander-in-chief and general, even though he doesn't technically have an army. But he said he had the prayer. Like the Praetor Guard? Yeah, no, oh, the Praetorian Guard, yes. But they weren't ever really army. They were more like the Secret Service. I mean, they were soldiers, but they didn't get used to go out in battle. They got used, but yes, he did have them. Um, later, emperors are going to use them, um, starting actually with his nephew, Augustus's nephew, Tiberius. They're going to sometimes sick the Praetorian Guard on the people in an unpleasant way. But Augustus never did that. Um, he was given the official rank of a consul and granted certain rights which usually belonged only to the consuls. He could summon the Senate for business, nominate candidates for office, issue decrees, and then, I'm going to skip down, he became proconsul of certain provinces. So he got authority over the governors. So this authority made Augustus the commander-in-chief of all armies of the empire. He didn't have his own army, but if you're over all the governors... Who all have armies? Like I'm the top of the heap. But all legitimately, you know, all granted by the Senate. He didn't grab anything. Um, I talked about Varus and the three legions that got massacred. And then you read a bunch. I'm not going to go over the, all the pictures of the beauties of Rome. Um, I... You know, I've probably got internet. I should try to remember when I get home. There's a very cool internet site, and it's sort of like a virtual tour of Imperial Rome. It's animated, but you can go through and see all the temples and stuff, and the camera goes through. It's very cool. I'll try to remember to send that. Yes. Um, I saw the, the plug on oh. the TV. Oh, um, yes. Which Do you remember who was in it or what? which um, version you watched? It was watched? like a 1950s one. Oh, okay. Um, it was like 1951. It was called Julius Caesar. Um, I'm trying to remember. The actor for Antony, my mom said that that was a famous actor in that time. Is Marlon, is Marlon Brando ring a bell? I think so. Because I think Marlon Brando was in a Julius Caesar. I don't know who he I played. Know, but, okay. What was it on? Did you watch it on? Um, my TV. Was no, my TV. Oh, oh, um, we have a Roku, so we watched it on Amazon Prime. For okay, a, okay. It was on. It was actually on sale for ninety nine cents. So awesome. It, so I do. I do urge you and Neil, you too, if you can find a, and the library system, um, in Illinois. You're in Illinois. Neil's in Illinois too. Um, through Prairie Cat, I know they had the BBC place. The Rock Island Library used to have them all. But if you put a hold on, they'll just send it to your local library. You probably do that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's really cool. But it, it does help a lot, doesn't yeah. it, to watch it? Because it's really not intended that you read it. 
like re it's like reading a movie script. Oh. It wouldn't be the same. There were some parts like at the beginning where he said like you know like get home you other creatures get you home. <laughs> uh, there's some there are some parts in it like when they had the jokes like they modernized it so people could understand and get a good laugh. Oh okay. It. Like he said um, instead of like using a lot of mid medieval language if you will, uh, he said. Um, I'm but a cobbler. All these people marching around the streets will help pay for my taxes due this week. And everyone started laughing. Yes. No one to laugh and stuff. Because that was the point of the joke, and that made it understandable. That's good. I like that. And he says, but what about Pompey? You all fell for him when he was here or whatever. And then, so, it is pretty old. So, like, when they, um, when, I don't know how to describe it, but just overall, it was really well done. Good. Yes, if you can, it's well always well worth watching it because that's what is intended. Uh, before we leave Augustus, here let me go ahead and see if I can manage to a get this out from under here without turning my computer off. Here are your questions for next week. Um, we are, yeah, I'll take those. We are skipping a section. I know we're skipping a section. Uh, we have this problem of time. And big books of these, which are really excellent books, but we have other things to read. And so we're skipping some like, a day in the life of a Roman man. You know, read it if you have time. Um, we also, um, in just a second, Colin, hold on to your thought. Um, <clears throat> my Wednesday kids stop two weeks before we do. We have two extra weeks. And I'm still deciding what I wanna do. I'm considering going back and reading and talking about some of those portions that we had to skip. Um, I'm also considering doing a little more reading of documents of the early church because that, uh, who doesn't want to read that? So I, we'll, we'll see. So we may come back to it, we may not, but if you went ahead and read it, read it, and then I decided to come back to it, then you've already read it. Yes, what was your question, um, Colin? Let me grab a tissue. Um, oh, yeah, sure. Here, would you take one of these and give one to Addison? So we're moving on to, um, thank you, um, we're moving on to the rest of Augustus's family, the, who's going to take control after Augustus dies? Remember, it's kind of dicey because Augustus came in and took control by force against Mark Antony, but we still have not seen a transfer of power peacefully to another emperor right what's gonna happen when Augustus dies is, is civil war gonna break out again is everybody going to uh, go at it like after Alexander the Great died you know or are we going to have have a system in place and Augustus had a very long reign he lived a long time and he put a system in place and the the going system is going to be that Emperors declare who their heir is going to be. They officially adopt someone. Um, if they don't have sons, and Augustus did not have a biological son. He had a daughter named Julia. He needs to adopt someone to become, and adopt didn't necessarily mean I'm going to raise you. You might adopt someone that's already an adult. Adopt meant you are now legally my son and heir. It's just like Julius Caesar adopting Octavius, okay? So um, he had numerous people earmarked <clears throat> for adoption, and they all died. They all kept dying. Until finally, his wife um, had a son named Tiberius. It, so it was his stepson. And Tiberius was kind of the only one left, the only candidate left. So he ended up with it. Yes. So, <clears throat> sorry, are these his biological kids? I mean, like, you said that they were, uh, they adopted it. Did that still con is that still considered in their family or just as who he picks? Um, it did not have to be in your family. In Augustus's case, they all were in his family. Um, but later on in the empire, you might pick someone who just seems like they would be a good ruler and they're outside your family. But for Augustus, all these people that kept dying, they were like, 
a nephew or a great nephew or his daughters, his grandsons, or, and they just all died through various means and uh, until Tiberius was left. So he finally had to say, okay, I'm gonna make Tiberius, you know, my son, he's my stepson legally, but now he's going to be my son and heir. Um, but, but the important thing is that when Augustus died, there was not a war. Everybody knew Tiberius is next. And when Tiber by the time Tiberius died, he had designated someone as being next. Now, if there's a sudden assassination, which there's going to be you know, in your next reading, then it's a little dicey. You know, because maybe you haven't put plans in place, but you can read about that. Um, so read that, answer the questions. And the other thing I asked you to, was to read through the book of Acts. And oh, before I forget, the next thing we're going to start reading is The Eagle of the Night <coughs> by Rosemary Sutcliffe. If you have never read it, it's really, really a good book. And well, if you have read it, it's really a good book. <laughs> it doesn't stop being a good book if you've read it. But I don't think you'll be upset if you end up reading it twice. Um, I've read it numerous times now, and I enjoy it every single time. And it is about um, the Romans in Britain. You are going to be reading, and again, I didn't bring that map with me, but you all know where Britain is. I'm pretty sure that island up there across the channel from France. Julius Caesar had invaded Britain, but it didn't really stick. You know, they... They drove them out. They stuck all those poles in the river, you know, and ripped holes in their ships. And Julius Caesar just turned around like, this isn't going well. But Claudius, who's going to be, there's going to be Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius. Claudius, when he becomes emperor, he had no real credits, like no military credits. He's like, you know, we're going to invade Britain. And it did stick. And they started setting up um, Roman forts. Yes. Um, what's the book called? The Eagle of the Night. The Is eagle. This week? Yes, I, this week I want you to read chapters one through six. It's going to be an easy read. All right, for you guys. Sophie should buy. Rosemary, so like Rosemary, and then Sutcliffe. S U T, and then Cliff. And I think she might have an E on the end of Cliff. Don't hold me to that. It's on the website. It's on the book list. Um, and I will post it on, I will go home and, oh, okay, okay. One chapter and two. One through six. So it'll be about a fourth of the book. We're going to spend four weeks on it. And work on your paper and bring me your paper next week. Okay. Um, so the book of Acts, I'm assuming you've probably read the book of Acts before or if you have never sat down and read, have, have either of you ever just sat down and read the entire book of Acts straight through? No. Because sometimes we don't. You know, sometimes you read stories, you read sections, and then you I've know read, the whole story. I've read but, the whole thing, but I haven't read it like any other yes, or two sections. as one document. Who, um, I mentioned this earlier, <coughs> who wrote Acts? Paul. No. Oh, Luke. Luke. Luke, which is interesting, and we know this partly by the style, but um, he... If you've ever looked at the beginning of the book of Luke, it says, here's how Luke, the gospel starts. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So he's writing to a guy named Theophilus. And then we start the book of Acts. This kind of reminds you that this is all one, it was all kind of one document. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. So he, he, he tells Theophilus, you know, this is where I got up to in my, my other book. Now I'm writing you, the sequel. This is what happened. Um, first of all, since 
maybe this is the first time you ever just sat down and read through the whole thing in one, uh, if you did it in one sitting, but in one, you know, go through. Did anything stand out to you that you've never thought about or noticed before about this time period? And it's okay if it's, you know, a negative. I'm not fishing for anything. I think it was cool ahead. when, like, he said, um, like, that he told them I was a Roman citizen, and he was a Roman citizen, and then they were, like, afraid Shoot. of him. Shoot, I know. Yeah. Shoot, we're not supposed to be beating him without a trial. Um, yes, okay, so Paul was a Roman citizen. It is also um, interesting that not only did Jesus come in the fullness of time during a time of peace when these people had built roads all over, <laughs> excuse me, but he also chose as one of his primary missionaries a man with Roman citizen status so that he had a, not a free pass to do anything he wanted. He was in jail plenty of times, stonings, floggings, by the way, did you notice who, what group of people tended to be the main stoners of Paul? Pharisees? Or like the Jews? The Jews. The Jews. It wasn't until riots broke out that the Romans got involved. They just didn't really care. They didn't really care what Paul said because they just didn't care who about people's religions. Um, I was just, before I came here, I'm reading a book, a church history book, and... Um, was reminded that, uh, you know, it's not that the Romans didn't like new religions. They brought any and every religion in, in the entire empire in. People in Rome were worshiping weird Egyptian stuff and Persian stuff, they didn't care. As long as you burnt your incense to Caesar and said your little formula. And it kind of was like saying the Pledge of Allegiance, although not quite because you had, it was like if we had to call the president Lord and not just like in a medieval sense, right? It was a civic duty, right? It was, it was something good citizens do. You do your pinch of incense, you, 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 you swear allegiance to Caesar as Lord, and then you go off and worship anything you want. The Christians wouldn't do that. Like, no, we're, we're sorry, there's one Lord. There's one Lord Jesus Christ, we don't do that. It's like, really? If you just do this little thing, it's not a big deal. We will leave you alone. So, um, so anyway, Paul got into it repeatedly, didn't he, with the Jews? Do you notice that Paul had a method of operation every time he came to a town? So oh, this is where I should get my, my map. So I brought, this is a great New Testament. So a lot of these cities you're going to recognize um, because they are cities to which Paul wrote letters, right? So around here so we have he writes the letter to Ephesus um, the Ephesians he writes the Philippians he writes Thessalonians um, this is the only Colossi is not on here um, but these are the towns that we hear of him traveling mm -hmm. to right um, with his base in Antioch he takes bigger and bigger and bigger trips. Interestingly, he comes to Troas, Troy, and that's where he gets his dream the, from Philippi, come over to Macedonia and help us. It's interesting that once upon a time the story was a bunch of Greeks went to Troy to invade. Now from Troy is coming the gospel invade Greece. But in each of these cities, I'm just going to read this out so we can refer to it. In each of these cities, where does Paul always go first? Do you remember? Like, I come to the city and I'm going to preach, but I'm going to do it this place first. Temple? What? Temple? Yeah, except the temple was in Jerusalem. It's the synagogue. Oh. There's only one temple, but every city that had a big enough Jewish population had a synagogue, which was basically like a local church, okay? You couldn't offer sacrifices there. 
but there was scripture reading and, and teaching. So we read, okay, let me find. Okay, Barnabas and Saul sent off. Um, okay, from Perga, they went to Pisidian Antioch. Now they're here. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. He always talks to them first, then the next, the next town. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. Uh, I'm not going to look through all of them, but this was his method. Now, when he gets to Philippi, it says, From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, which is, is one of the islands here, and the next day for Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. By the way, what had happened in Philippi about 100 years before this? 80 years, maybe? You will see me at, see where spirit says, you oh. will see me at Philippi. Yeah. This is the Brutus Cassius battle place. Mm. That's where they fought. Okay. So he goes to Philippi and it says, um, we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. Philippi doesn't have a synagogue. He is getting to the place where there aren't enough Jews living in Philippi to actually build a synagogue. It's spreading, it's spreading. It's spreading outside the Jewish community. So interesting, his method. Why, why do you think he did that? Why not just go to the, the public forum, you know, like the, uh, and just preach in general to people. Why go to the synagogue maybe first? They, <clears throat> maybe to get to the Jews first. And why would he want to get to the Jews first? Give them a chance to accept it. Give them a chance to accept it. Paul is a Jew. These are his people. He loves them. Jesus was a Jew. He was sent, in fact, in Jesus's lifetime, he, you know, when Gentiles came, that woman who, who begged for healing for her daughter, he said, it is not right to take the children's food and feed it to the dogs. Right? I came to the lost sheep of Israel. That was Jesus's mission, to give a chance to Israel to accept their God. Um, but she said, but even the dogs get crumbs that fall from the table, which answer he loved and healed the lady's daughter. Well, the crumbs are coming in full force here very soon, but right now he's trying to feed the children. But he gets all the way to Athens. And in Athens, Paul changes tactics. First of all, Athens does not have a synagogue. Second of all, we spent a whole semester talking about Greece, okay? Who do the Greeks worship? <clears throat> the Greek gods? Okay, Greece. the Greek gods. By the time of Paul, they they might have they might have gone to the temple. I don't think any of these people really believed in Zeus and Hera and all of that. But they still did it, again, sort of like a public responsibility. But they had a new oh I don't know, rival, I don't want to call it a god, but a really philosophy. Right? In fact, um, this gets mentioned in this section. I'm going to read the section where Paul is in Athens. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Oh, I, I just lied to you. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks. They did have a synagogue in Athens. I'm so sorry. As well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, some translations say Mars Hill, which is what Areopagus means in translated. Um, it's their 
sort of political meeting place, but also just talking place. And by the way, I, I don't want to do anything because I don't want to mess up. I don't know what will happen if I start pressing buttons here, but um, I've got pictures. Like we climb the Areopagus, we climb Mars Hill, my son and I. I've got pictures if you would like to see Mars Hill, Patricia and son. Um, they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they mean. And then there's this comment. All the Athenians and the foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. <laughs> what a life. Okay, get some food and then I just hang out all day and talk. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, now, rewind. Do you remember when Stephen was being stoned? Okay, and he gave a history lesson. Our fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they did this and they did that and we came out of Egypt. And, um, Peter does a similar thing at Pentecost. You men of Israel, you know, and he gives them a history lesson. It's not going to do Paul any good to give a history lesson here. Because these people aren't Jews. They don't know anything about Jewish history. He could talk about Abraham till he's blue in the face and they're not going to care because they don't know who this Abraham guy is. He's got to shift his tactics, and he does. Here's what he says to the Athenians. Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God, because they didn't want to leave any out, you know. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by hands. Right? He's surrounded by temples. All these beautiful temples in Athens. He does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Now he's quoting a Greek poet. Now he's going to use their own literature to persuade them. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. He completely changes tactics. They don't need a history lesson because they don't understand the history. What they need is, you know, all the stuff around you, the world, uh, it's the God that made that. He doesn't really need these temples. And even your own poets have talked about <clears> him. <throat> they just didn't know the, who they were talking about. It's brilliant. Paul is a brilliant man. The Holy Spirit is brilliant. But Paul keeps traveling around and finally he ends up back in, in Jerusalem where, oh, by the way, I want to talk about the, the riot in Ephesus. Do you guys remember a, but a group of people rioted against Paul in the city of Ephesus? Do you remember why they riot, who they were and why they were rioting? About this time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. Early Christians referred to it as the way. Okay? A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business. And you see in here now, this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia be the whole what you stay turkey he says that man-made gods are no gods at all there is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name but also that the temple of the great goddess artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of asia will be robbed of her divine majesty all right so what's what's his argument why is this bad for them because they're they make um don't they make what was it? Shrines. Silver shrines of Artemis, like little statues, little. So they make stuff, and he's for that god, and he's um, 
just crazy that God's yeah. real. Nobody's going to buy our little statues. <clears throat> We're not going to have enough money. So, we need to get rid of this Paul. So, it says that they yell. They go into the, the marketplace and they yell, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians for a couple of hours. It's a lot of time. Now, note. In Ephesus was a temple to Artemis that was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The temple of Diana at Ephesus, or Artemis. One of the seven wonders. This drew people from everywhere. It's like going to see the Statue of Liberty or, you know, going to the Eiffel Tower in Paris or something. It draws tourists. So not only are they getting business in Ephesus, they get all the tourist business. They're making a very good living at this. And so there is a riot, a massive riot. Um, and this is the sort of thing that calls the Romans out, right? In general, they don't care, but riots they don't, they don't put up with. Um, so, but eventually, uh, Paul ends up in Jerusalem, and because he is a Roman citizen, he has a special privilege. When he is accused of anything, and he was accused by the Jews in Jerusalem, do you remember what they think Paul had done wrong? I mean, in general, they just hate him because he's become a Christian. and he's. But it was a specific thing that they suspected he had done in Jerusalem. Do you remember what that was? They, they stirred up all the people? It, no, it was more specific than that. They thought he brought a Gentile into the temple precincts. Timothy. Timothy is only half Jewish. Mm. He had Timothy circumcised. He had Timothy obey all the rules just so as not to offend anyone. Um, but Paul was known to travel not only with Timothy, but with other people who were completely not Jewish at all and did not observe the, the Jewish rules. They were not allowed in the temple precincts. There was actually a court, like there were do you know what I mean? Like courts within courts within courts. And there was an outer one, and it was the court of the Gentiles, and you could go there. And then there's an inner one that's the, the court of the women. And if you're a Jewish woman, you can go in that one. <clears throat> and then there's a court of the Jewish men, you know, and then there's the temple and everything. So it gets smaller and smaller. You could go in that outside one, but you couldn't go farther than that. Paul could go all the way to the court of the men. And they, no proof, they claimed, because he traveled a lot with non-Jewish people, I think he brought those non-Jewish people into the temple. And because they were causing such a hubbub, and that's stirring up the people, um, the Romans took him into custody. And Paul knew he wasn't going to get a fair trial. In fact, do you remember the story where he found out they were going to transfer him and there was a group of guys that were going to assassinate him on the way? And his nephew found out about it and came in the prison and told, the, and they snuck him out. And I, <clears throat> he decided there's no way... I'm going to get a fair trial. And he did something that all Roman citizens can do. I appeal to Caesar. I want, I appeal to the Supreme Court. I want my case taken to the very top, Supreme Court. I don't know why Paul did that. Did he think he would be, you know, have a better chance? Did he just want to be taken to Rome so that he could, you know, spread the gospel to Rome. I mean, there were already Christians in Rome because he was writing the book of Romans to somebody. But um, but tradition tells us he did, th that is not, the book of Acts doesn't end with him in prison and he's going to die there. He's going to get let out by studying the rest of his letters. Um, they can see that he gets let out and he travels some more. There's speculation that he went all the way to Spain. That can't, we can't prove that. There's just traditions that kind of hint that he went to Spain. But later on in the books of, uh, in 2 Timothy, he's in prison, and it's real deal prison this time. You know, if, if you notice the book of Acts, he's in a private residence with two guards, but he's like under house arrest. He's not in a prison. And they let people come see him as much as they want. It's, it's not bad. And he waits a couple of years to hear his, to have his case heard. Under house arrest? But during that couple of years, he can talk to anybody, you know, like friends. Oh, I want to go hear this Paul guy preach. And he just preached to anybody who wanted to come see him. It, it, 
I mean, it's not the best, but it wasn't so bad. But by the time you write Second Timothy, he's hardcore. He talks about chains. And he knows he's about to die. The point where he says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. It's his life of Paul. But on his way to Rome, they have some difficulties, don't they? The Mediterranean is a very stormy place. Remember Odysseus? Mm -hmm. Remember the story of the Odyssey we read about? Odysseus was coming home from Troy. Heck, Menelaus was coming home from Troy. And these people got blown all over the place. Menelaus got blown to Egypt. Odysseus got blown. Who knows? People speculate about all the, ooh, I think the clashing rocks were here, and I think the sirens were there, and they speculate. We don't know. But the point was, storms kept cropping up and blowing people all over the place. This is a thing that happens in the Mediterranean, apparently, at certain times of year. And they were leaving kind of late in the year. They made it to Crete. And who were they leaving from? They were leaving from, uh, I think, Caesarea. They were leaving from down here on the coast, okay? They made it to Crete, and they were put in, and Paul told them, we need to just stay here. This is not a good time to travel. And the captain's like, yeah, I can do it. So they actually are just putting in, they go out and they're just trying to go around the island to put it in another harbor, but the wind takes them and it blows them for two weeks just all over the place. And they end up shipwrecked here on Malta. This is where the snake bit him. Do you remember that? And everybody's like, oh, you're going to die. He must have done something really bad because he survived a shipwreck and then a snake bit him. That's funny. And then he went to Rome. Um, again, shipping in the Mediterranean. This is a Rome, ships all over, crossing back and forth. Um, so Acts is a wonderful story about the early church, but it's also a very cool look at travel in the Roman world um, and what it was like as the gospel, as the message started going out to people who didn't really have a Jewish background. So I hope you enjoyed your look at that. So, Neil, I'm going to shut off. Um, I don't really have anything else to say. And I'm going to show them my pictures, and then you'll just have to see the pictures next week. And remember, there's part one and part two. I guess if you're watching this, you already saw part two. So see you next week.